you can go live. Okay, sounds great. Um, so let me. No, I'm going to play the video if you want. I mean, as you wish. <laughs> I'm here. Should I start and then you can play the video if I have any troubles? Okay, fine. Okay, we saw that the video is not completely bulletproof, so uh, I'm still debating between two different talks, but I, I'll just give the one that I've recorded. <laughs> so, uh, um, hello everyone. So, I'm Manolis Kellis. What I'd like to tell you about is the work that we've been doing on uh, dissecting the regulatory circuitry of uh, disease-associated regions. This is primarily work by Carlos Boisch, and uh, this was posted in a bioarchive last October, and it's in the hopefully final stages of review. And in collaboration with Ben James, Youngjin Park, Vado Melleman, several current and former Lambert, uh, members of the lab. Uh, and it combines ENCODE data, roadmap epigenomics data, genomics of gene regulation, GGR data, as well as systematic imputation, and of course, genome-wide association studies to understand both regulation and disease. So our goal is to basically dissect the mechanism underlying these 120,000 genetic loci that have been associated with disease. The goal is to, to reveal new disease mechanisms, new target genes, new therapeutics, and enable precision medicine. The challenge, however, is that if you look under the hood, if you open up these regions of association, in this example, FTO, that has 89 common variants in association, none of them actually perturb the protein directly. Instead, as we showed for this example, they perturb genes nearby whose expression is affected, ultimately leading to disease. And in this particular case, the gene nearby is not FTO at all. It's instead two different genes that are sitting 1.2 million nucleotides away and 600,000 nucleotides away. So the challenge of dissecting GWAS mechanism is that in 93% of cases, the disease hits are non-coding, which means the target gene is not known, the causal variant is not known, the cell type of action is not known, the relevant pathways and the mechanisms are not known. So the approach that we take in my lab is to systematically uh, start with disease genetics across common and rare variants, and then profile RNA and the epigenome in healthy and disease samples. And over the last few years, this has been primarily single cell RNA sequencing and single cell attack sequencing. So my lab alone did 1,500 post-mortem samples from brain in the last 12 months and with many collaborations across many other disorders. So we integrate all these data sets to predict driver genes, regions, and cell types computationally, and then we go and validate these predictions using cell cultures and mouse models, and of course, disseminate the results and start all over again. The project that I'll be talking today is the closest tie with ENCODE, that's why I chose to focus on this one, and it's basically EPIMAP, which stands for uh, Epigenomic uh, Integration Across Multiple Annotation Projects, uh, which basically seeks to systematically uniformly process, impute, and validate a large number of data sets, then use them to predict high-resolution enhancers and chromatin states using um, H3K27 acetylation, using uh, Chrome HMM, and using DNA hypersensitive sites, leading to 2.1 million enhancer locations across 833 biosamples, which we can now integrate systematically uh, using the uh, tree of relationships of these samples, and also study the activity patterns of them to link transcription factors to their enhancers and enhancers to their target genes. And then we use all of that to in, in, interpret GWAS across tissues, targets, and fine mapping, and also to carry out system genetics across multiple traits simultaneously. There's an enormous data resource that I really encourage you to uh, explore for all of these uh, 14,000 epigenomes across 800 samples at combio.mitdu slash epimap. And then there's uh, browsers in there, as well as all of the figures that I'm going to show you can regenerate through that website. Number two, we've basically uh, provided a lot of insights for gene regulation, so focusing on heart, on blood, on brain, and 800 different uh, tissues and cell types. We have modules of activity, we have regulators that lightly control them, and we have uh, the circuitry of these motifs and regulators. And the third contribution is across GWAS and genome-wide association studies, looking at specific loci across 30,000 different disease loci. You can find pictures and predictions linking these non-coding regions to their likely target genes. So let's dive right in. So these are the 14,000 data sets that we've imputed across 830 samples. So most of them are both observed and imputed. Sorry, many of them are observed and imputed, but most of them are primarily imputed. And you can see here the sample types systematically across three tiers based on the density of uh, observed data. So 
uh, this, in, this combines ENCODE, roadmap, GGR, many different tissue types, uh, biological sexes, uh, type of tissue across tissue cell line, primary cells, in vitro differentiated cells, and many life stages. And here's the imputation studies for each of them. So how do we impute the data? We've used Chrome Impute, a tool developed by Jason Ernst, formerly in my group, who's now a professor at UCLA. And then for every target mark in a given cell type, we use both uh, the relationship of different marks across uh, tissues and the relationship of different tissues across marks to basically impute the missing data. Here's the imputed data in red and here's the hidden observed data in gray. And you can see this very strong agreement uh, and you can see this agreement for the uh, new resource of EpiMap across 25 KB resolution to 100 KB resolution and 1.5 millinucleotide resolution. You can see here the individual dips in the chromatin profile associated with uh, TF binding and nucleosome displacement, as well as both uh, short range and long range uh, features. And you can see here how well the imputed data agrees with the observed data for the subset of data that we have actually observed across 2000 different randomly selected regions. You can see this capture of the patterns of activity very nicely. When the data don't agree, when, uh, annotate, when observed and imputed data don't agree, you basically uh, can actually blame it on the uh, observed data. So here's the samples that we flag uh, as red, as not agreeing well, and you see that they have some of the lowest scores across all samples, suggesting that perhaps there's something wrong with the experiment rather than the imputation. We've also generated experimental data in the context of ENCODE to systematically validate the uh, imputation. And what you can see here is that if you compare the prediction of our imputed data to the prediction that you would make based on the nearest track, which is unfortunately an unattainable gold standard because in practice, it's only knowable after the target track has already been generated. You can see that imputed data in fact outperforms even this best possible predictor 96% of the time for punctate marks and 77% of the time for broad marks. And compared to the average, we outperform average predictions with 100% of the time for punctate and 73% of the time for broad. And you can see here just systematically uh, the quality of imputation is systematically higher than uh, any kind of other way of inferring the data computation. So this is the relationships that we can learn between the different samples. You can see the primary axis of variation, distinguishing different types of tissues and different lineages uh, across activating marks and repressive marks. You can see the uh, organization of these samples using these high resolution enhancer annotations that I mentioned across these 2.1 million enhancers and how these different samples relate with each other. And we can now start systematically annotating the chromatin state for each of those. This is the roadmap, which we felt was pretty enormous at 127 different tissues in 2015. This is now 833 tissues that we have annotated chromatin states for. And again, all of this is browsable uh, systematic. We've now grouped these 2.1 million enhancers at the top into 300 modules right below. And you can see some modules contain many more enhancers than others. And these modules are 3% tissues uh, global. So these are highly uh, active across many different tissues, but 97% tissue specific. And you can see here how they light up in specific blood, brain, embryonic stem cell, uh, epithelial cells, and other uh, organs. So we can use these modules now to start gaining insights on the gene regulation of these regions by looking at what are the downstream gene ontology terms that are enriched and you can see the uh, you know, cardiac samples, for example, are enriching in ca cardiac functions, as you would expect. And there's some sharing of functions across different tissues, but the resolution at which we can dissect these functional enrichments is, is quite, quite remarkable. We can also look upstream at what are the upstream likely regulators associated with these um, um, annotations, specifically these enhancer modules. And what you can see is that there's a subset of motifs that are quite ubiquitous that are sort of active throughout, and then a subset of motifs that are quite tissue specific. And their combinations are in fact what leads to the tissue regulatory circuitry that we can infer for each of these uh, annotations. We can also start partitioning these biosamples into relevant structures, motifs, and combinatorial interactions. You can see here the uh, you know, HNF1A regulator acting in many different tissues and in any one of these tissues combining with multiple other uh, regulators to infer activity. And you can also see these modules that are very high resolution. All of this is browsable uh, on our website. 
We've also systematically predicted enhancer gene links from uh, the correlation patterns between the transcription and the epigenome to basically figure out what are the target genes of particular gene regulatory regions and of course particular uh, genetic loci. And what you can see in blue is that we are uh, outperforming most of existing methods in nearly all of the benchmarks. And uh, overall, we've expanded beyond just a few tissues for which other predictions were made to 833 tissues. And these are extremely tissue specific. These links are uh, on average active in only three groups and are linking to about 42 KB downstream. And every enhancer links to a median of three genes. Uh, and every gene has a median of 23 different enhancers. These are the genetic association enrichments that we're finding across uh, 540 different traits versus the 803 epigenomes. So if you uh, classify these traits according to the number of tissues that they're enriched in, you can basically infer unifactorial traits, which are a minority at 26, multifactorial traits, which are very much a, major a majority at 166, and then a subset of polyfactorial traits, which are showing these broad enrichments across many different tissues. What's really exciting here is that we can now start going into the individual loci and find places where the enriched annotations are helping explain some of the top loci. So here we have the top loci ranked from uh, you know, most significant to least significant. And then you can see that at the top, we have this you know, enhancer uh, associated with brain, with, sorry, with breast cancer, which is active in a breast cancer line and sitting only 30 nucleotides away. And you can see here the extremely high co-localization of the SNPs and the enhancer and how it's linked through a link to a target gene that actually makes a lot of sense biologically for breast cancer. Here's another example for schizophrenia, where you see the linking is in fact taking you from this broadly active region, which is broadly associated across many SNPs, and then connecting to this calcium signaling factor, which is again implicated in schizophrenia. But the interesting part is when you're looking at all of these traits together, you can now start looking at global patterns of enrichment. You can see how schizophrenia, neuroticism, uh, math ability, intelligence are in fact clustering in brain. By contrast, Alzheimer's, which you know, one would argue is a brain trait, is acti uh, act, um, enriching primarily in enhancers active in immune cells, predominantly because of the action in microglia. If you look at heart, liver, you see cholesterol, you see blood pressure, you see filtering functions in kidney, and you also see these polyfactorial traits sitting in there in the middle of this network, including coronary artery disease, which is enriched in 19 different tissues. And what's exciting here is that you can now start partitioning the genetic loci associated with these polyfactorial traits into their components. For coronary artery disease, you see both liver and coronary artery capturing different subsets of functions and different subsets of loci and different subsets of the comorbidity patterns of coronary artery disease with other disorders, which is very exciting. We can now take some of that complexity and peel off layers of complexity. Here's a locus that is associated primarily with liver. Here's another locus primarily associated with heart and coronary artery. And here's another locus that appears on the surface to be primarily liver, but in fact shows all of these additional enhancers that are acting in heart, suggesting that uh, this uh, pleiotropy and this multifaceted function might al also be at the level of individual loci, as you can see here with some loci, not all, but some loci acting broadly across all of these tissues that are enriched. So I really encourage you to explore this website, compire.mid.edu/epimap. You will find all of these links there and all of these predictions. And uh, this is work primarily by Carlos Boisch in collaboration with many uh, lab members. And again, this is a very small part of what we do in the lab. Most of our work nowadays is on single cell dissection of disorders. Uh, but uh, you know, that's for another talk another day. I'll stop there and I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks so much, Manolas. We do have some questions. The first is a, a quick one. Um, are EpiMap data also available on the ENCODE portal? Yeah, so absolutely. This is something that we're working with uh, uh, the folks over at ENCODE uh, to do that. So they're now available from the roadmap portal uh, at the WashU Epigenome Browser. And uh, Cardis is working with the ENCODE folks, so hopefully even before publication, they will be available through the ENCODE portal. But for now, you can find them at the website that I listed and also through the UCSC browser. And uh, we're working on the ENCODE portal for 
Okay, the next question is a, a little more technical um, uh, from Alejandra. Uh, uh, so enhancers are defined by the combination of chrome HMM, uh, D, uh, DNA, and uh, HDK27 acetyl, but I was under the impression that the acetylation was already included in chrome HMM. Maybe I missed something, can you comment? No, 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 that's a, that's a fantastic question. Indeed, this seems on the surface a little counterintuitive, but the reason for that is that we are, um, we are looking for a high resolution annotation and these enhancer chromatin states sometimes are broader. So you could use only the enhancer states by themselves, but then you wouldn't have the precise localization of the peak that tells you where it is. You could use only the peaks, but then some of them are actually found in promoters and they won't necessarily be enhancers. It's the combination of the enhancer chromatin state that allows us to know that it is not some kind of other type of element, but it's truly an enhancer, and the peak itself that allows us to position it precisely within the HTK27 acetylation signal within this broader interval, and also the DHS side. So overall, these cover 0.8% of any one epigenome, and collectively only 13.8% of the genome. So, um, you know, and, and all of the results that I showed on the regulatory circuitry are based on this 0.8% per tissue. So it's a highly concentrated um, you know, view of gene regulation, whereas enhancer chromatin states are a little broader and they would capture more of the landscape. So that's why we use a combination of the three. Maybe it's overkill, but at least you know, it seems to work and it's a very high resolution and high quality annotation. That, that's why we are you know, sort of pushing in that direction. Thanks for the great question, Alejandra. I think it's, um, it's a very good one. Okay, and in maybe terms of chrome HMM states, we basically use a combination of um, you know, multiple classes of enhancer annotations uh, that, that sort of allows to capture a broader uh, set of elements. But then you could, with the chromatin states, go further, subdivide these uh, elements that way. Okay, fantastic. Um, maybe we'll just move on since uh, okay. we are on schedule. <laughs> um, so the last speaker for our session